Well, this morning we're talking about a man named Abram. Now, he later on becomes known as Abraham, and his wife, who at this point is called Sarai, becomes known as Sarah. And I'm just going to warn you, I'll probably go back and forth in referring to them in our, uh, when I preach today, because I'll probably forget to call him Abram all the time. But Abram is known as a hero of the faith. In fact, he's actually the hero of more than one faith, most especially the Jewish faith, but also Islam. Islam is known as an Abrahamic faith. And as Christians, our faith owes much to Abram, Abram as well. The Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, saw Abram as the paradigm of our faith. And in Romans, he goes on to say this, Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. So Paul refers to Abram, or Abraham, as the father of all who have faith in God. Incidentally, his wife Sarai is also known as a mother of the faith. Some Jewish people refer to themselves as daughters of Sarah. And both Abraham and Sarah get mentioned in the hall of fame of faith, so to speak, in Hebrews chapter 11, where we read, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And by faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. So it's hard to overestimate the influence that Abraham and Sarah have on shaping the faith of those who came after them. It's also hard to overestimate this particular event in the overall shaping of the biblical story. Some people have even called Genesis chapter 12, which we read today, the linchpin of the Bible's story. You see, up until the, this point in Genesis, the story has followed a fairly predictable cycle. God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, and God declared them good and then very good. But then, very quickly, things begin to degenerate, and the violence and evil perpetrated by humanity begins to rise until God acts to keep it in check from the sin of those first humans to the murderous Cain to the rise of evil so great that in Genesis chapter 6 it says every inclination in the thoughts of humanity was all evil all the time. That's pretty bad. Last week we looked at the story of Noah and the flood and how God put a sign in the sky to remind God of God's promise never to destroy the world by flood again. But even after that happens, even after Noah starts again, humanity is at it again, causing one commentator to quip, the first book of the Bible might well be titled Genesis or the Book of Divine Disappointment. And so, with Abram, and with Sarai, God begins again. God is going about redeeming the world, and this time God focuses on one family. We cannot miss, however, that while it is Abraham, with Sarah and Lot in tow, who the, hum, uh, the one human family that God partners with, it is clear that God is not just blessing this one family. Right off the bat, God says to Abram, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So God envisions, when God calls Abraham and his family, that they are going to become a gift that will reach the entire world. And with this one family, God begins a new thing, a new way to restore and win humanity to God's self once and for all. And it all begins when Abram hears the voice of God telling him, leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. So Abram left as the Lord told him. But since Abram and Sarah are such key figures, I would even go so far as to call them prototypes of our faith, if you will. 
It's tempting to want the answer to a particular question. Why Abram? Why Sarai? Now, Genesis 12 is not actually the first time we meet these characters, so maybe we can learn a little from the backstory of Abram. At the end of Genesis 11, we get one of those genealogies. Most of us like to skip over them anyway, but it does give us some information. It says, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. While, Terah, while his father Terah was alive, Haran lived in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And she was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarai was childless. She was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of Abram, and together they set out for Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and then he died in Haran. So that's our backstory on this family. That's the information that we have. They came from a place known as Ur of the Chaldeans. There are three brothers, but one of them has died. And Abram's father began as a pilgrim, too, he left his home in Ur of the Chaldeans. He intended to go to Canaan, which will be the land that God promises to Abraham. But for some reason, Terah stops in a place called Haran, which is the same name as his son who passed away. And so some people have begun to wonder whether or not there's some significance to that. Did Abraham's father get stuck in his grief over the loss of his son, or is the name of the town just a coincidence? But whatever it was that kept Abram's father from moving on, there in Haran, Abram's father died as well. So Abraham effectively has very little family. His father has passed away. His brother has passed away. The other brother and his wife, they seem to have left behind in Ur of the Chaldeans. And the story is very clear on this point. His wife, Sarai, can't have children. So why did Paul, in Hebrews 11, say that from one man and he as good as dead came all this? Probably because Abraham didn't have much of a future. Abram is not said to be particularly religious or righteous. He's not someone who is searching. Nobody says he has great leadership potential. In fact, all we know about him is that he's already married and his wife can't have children. So when God comes to him and promises him land and a family, it actually seems kind of impossible. It is as if this family is at its end. They've lost their patriarch, and Abraham and Sarah don't have much chance of having a family of their own. In fact, this beginning feels a little like an ending. And if you are paying attention, for those of us who were with us this summer when we looked at the book of Ruth, that story began at the end as well. But somehow God brought something from that ending. But all we know about this family, before this remarkable call comes to Abraham, when God comes to him with this huge ask, this great step of faith that Abram is asked to take, is that they don't seem to have much of a future. So God is making some pretty big promises to the people who would seem the least likely to receive that which God is promising. But since Abraham and Sarah are the prototypes of our faith, what can they tell us about following God? What can they tell us except that they've already seen their share of tragedy? What was it about Abraham that caught the eye of the creator of the universe this question is so irresistible that many Jewish commentaries have been developed to explain it, but the text doesn't tell us anything for sure. We might wish to know, for instance, what season of life Abram was in. What was his everyday existence like? What did he do day in and day out when he heard God's voice and he did what God said? What were Abram and Sarai thinking before they packed up all their household wealth everyone and anything that belonged to them, including their nephew Lot, 
and take it all to a place that they had never laid eyes on before. Did Abram follow God's voice because he couldn't stand another day of the routine his life was locked into for what seemed like forever? Or was he some sort of restless person who always wanted something new? Or was he kind of a play it safe guy and he just out of character decided to risk everything on this calling? Did he talk it over with Sarah and Lot? Or did he just tell them they had to pack their bags and get in the wagon? For that matter, what did Sarah and Lot think about this? Were they sad? Were they eager? Were they a little bit of both? To leave their land and their livelihood and their family and everything they had known? Were they resigned to what Abram told them to do? Did they try to talk him out of it? Did it matter to Abram what they thought at all? But above all, we might wonder how Abram knew it was God's voice that called to him and why he obeyed it. But here's one theory that I have that emerges from this story. When God's voice rings in Abram's ear for the first time, or I suppose it could have been the 50th, we don't know how often God spoke to Abram before he went, he doesn't seem to be chosen for any particular gifts or characteristics that he possesses. Maybe Abram is the model of our faith, not because he was so special as to be the only one on the world that God would call, but maybe Abram is special because he responded to God's call, and he went. Abram joined God on the journey, and he put one foot in front of the other, and he started walking. And this makes me think that maybe God's call is big, and it is wide, and it is actually our response to the call that matters. See, maybe the person of the faith is the one who chooses to go on the journey. Throughout the pages of scripture, it is not necessarily the most talented, or the people who are the biggest, or the strongest, or the fastest, or the most beautiful, or the most successful who partner with God. God calls, and people follow, and often we don't know why. Noah was brought into God's plan and asked to build an ark to save his family and a selection of animals. But all we know at that point in the story is he was considered more righteous than anyone else in his generation. And at least one commentator pointed out that might actually not be saying that much about Noah, considering the rest of the generation is described as people who thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil from morning till night. So it could be a pretty low bar there. Otherwise, we're not sure about what it was about Noah that was so righteous he caught God's eye, but God called and Noah built. God called Abram and Sarah and they go. God calls Moses and Moses follows, reluctantly to be sure, but God even seems to work with Moses' reluctance. When Naomi was without kindred in the world and it felt like God had abandoned her, Ruth, her daughter-in-law, boldly says, Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. And then Ruth refused to abandon Naomi and followed her to Bethlehem. In fact, Ruth's decision to follow Naomi and leave her own land and home and family behind has actually been compared with Abraham's actions here in Genesis chapter 12. When Esther heard about the plot against her people, her uncle Mordecai urged her, saying, Who knows but that you came to a royal position for such a time as this? And Esther eventually responds to him by saying, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. When Isaiah sees a vision of the splendor of God filling the temple and hears the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Isaiah instantly responds, Here I am, Lord. Send me. When a young girl has an angel interrupt her life and tell her that she's going to give birth to the Son of the Most High, she responds saying, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And as we read in the Gospel reading today, Andrew and Peter were just going about their everyday work 
when they encounter Jesus and all Jesus says to them is, follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, they saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and instantly they left the boat and their father and followed him. So God might call different people at different times and in different ways. And the people whose stories we've just mentioned, and many, many others in the pages of Scripture, the call comes to them differently. They hear the voice of God. They see a burning bush. They experience the distress or pain of someone they love. Sometimes it comes to them through the nudging of the voice of a family member, or through a supernatural vision, or an angelic visit, or a personal encounter with Jesus. But however these people in these stories encounter God, when God calls them, they go. Sometimes they ask a question or two. Sometimes they don't. But they set out on the pathway of faithfulness and they follow God, even though it changes their lives. The ones who do God's will on earth, the ones whose stories are told in scriptures, are the willing ones. They're the ones who get busy building an ark, or go to the place that God will show them in the some undefined future, or who lead the people God has put under their care, or who care for those that they love, or who do the difficult thing because it is the right thing, or who write the words that God lays on their hearts, or who agree to God's plan even though it upends their lives, or who drop their nets and follow Jesus. Now recently, some of us had the joy of attending the celebration of the ordination service of Robel Ferre. He leads the Eritrean congregation who meets in our building. And for those of you who were there, you might recognize this because these were the words that I was able to give to Robel. And it's a much shorter way of saying what I've been trying to say in many words. But it's this. God doesn't call the gifted. God gifts the called. Only I don't think it only applies to someone who is, for instance, on staff at a church or ordained or paid to do ministry, although it does apply to them as well. But I think that many and probably even all people are called by God. And the question isn't so much, is God calling me? The question is, will I go? And so we have this the linchpin of the biblical story in which God changes tactics and calls one family. But blessing this family, God wants to bless the whole world. And remarkably, though we don't quite even know why, Abram and Sarah pack up their livelihood and they set out, not knowing what the future would hold. And they go also knowing that nothing they have in and of themselves or their own resources is sufficient to go. So they go trusting God alone to direct their future. And the thing is, God still wants to bless the whole world. And God often does this through willing people who partner with God, who start out on the journey, who allow God to lead them, who bless others, who become the salt and light in this world. Because God doesn't call the gifted. God gives gifts to those he calls. God calls you. How do you respond to God's call? Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? God of covenant, you promised Abram land and descendants and blessings, and you did this so that he might be a blessing for all. Help us, God, to hear your voice, which calls us. Help us to accept the gifts that you give us. And help us to respond to your call that we might be a blessing to others, that the world may know. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And as you go from this place, go as one called by God. As you go, know the love of the Holy Spirit pours into your heart just as you are. And as you go, remember that you are blessed to be a blessing to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Go in peace.